Okay, so this screencast is going to talk about drug design. Some of the objectives that we want to make sure that we focus on are describe the use of a compound library in drug design, explain the use of combinatorial and parallel chemistry to synthesize new drugs, describe how computers are being used in drug design, how the polarity of a molecule can be modified to increase its aqueous solubility and how this facilitates its distribution around the body, and then to describe the use of chiral auxiliaries to form the desired enantiomer. So those are the things that we'll be looking um, at in this screencast. Okay, the, the kind of broke the screencast into three um, sections. The first one is building molecules um, that bind to biomarkers and how this is done. Um, and as mentioned before, it would be through combinatorial and parallel synthesis, high throughput screening, and computer-aided design. Then we'll move on to how to modify molecules to improve that solubility, and that building molecules to exhibit that stereoisomerism. Isomerism. All right, so the first thing to talk about um, is rational drug design, and this has been developed in the past um, several years, right? and, and it comes about because we've learned more and more about diseases in the body and how to um, bind drugs to that to either block the pathway um, that that disease takes in the body or similar routes to, to prevent it from having uh, an effect on the body. So the, the idea is that we have a pretty good idea of what the biological receptor would be for a disease, a virus, a bacterial. Um, and knowing the shape and the polarity and the features of that receptor you can design this drug molecule so that it fits into that receptor um, through a phase known as recognition and you make a supramolecular complex okay? and what this does is it blocks the disease mechanism from going on to have some kind of physiological effect in the body. Okay. So the idea is to focus on how to make this drug molecule to fit into that biological receptor. So come, they go about it in a very logical uh, approach called rational drug design. You identify that lead compound and we've talked about this process previously and now we're just going to look a little bit more in detail. Okay. So identifying that, you're going to look for a molecule that has biological activity. That means something that's going to work. Through either combinatorial synthesis or parallel synthesis, I'm having trouble, um, you can synthesize a lot of drugs at one time and potentially come up with um, a lot of potential cures or molecules that would work very quickly. Um, and then you need some high throughput screening, meaning ways to test all of these drugs made in this process very quickly to, to weed out the ones that have no effect. Um, this synthesis process results in the formation of a large chemical library. And it's really just a series of similar compounds with corresponding physical chemical data and some, hopefully, some kind of biological activity. It's called a chemical library, also called a combinatorial library. So in combinatorial synthesis, we need a method for synthesizing an entire library of related drugs all at once. So we're going to make just a boatload of compounds all at once or at least very quickly. This important thing to note is that this kind of synthesis generates a mixture of related compounds. Okay, a mixture of related compounds, not just one. 
Okay, and this is contrasting to parallel synthesis, which we'll look at in just a moment. If we look at a particular graph from your book, traditional synthesis, we would focus on making one compound. In this combinatorial synthesis, we can make a bunch of compounds pretty much at the same time or um, very quickly. Key features used in this combinatorial synthesis is it's an automated process, meaning you have robotics involved. Um, you react a family of similar compounds with a variety of reagents, and you get a large library of similar compounds. And those compounds, again, are produced as a mixture. Again, that's an important difference between these two synthesis methods. And the first method that we're going to look at is called the mix and split method. Okay, and this is a solid surface um, technique. We, they use resin, um, sometimes polystyrene beads, and these beads um, are put into three different reactors, reactor A, reactor B, reactor C. And those A, B, and C are building blocks. Okay, so in reactor A, you know, one of the A molecules attaches to a bead. Same thing happens in the C or the B reactor. Same thing in the C reactor. Then we pool and we mix these different resins. Okay, so we're splitting those up and again mixing them with A so that we get these kinds of compounds. Okay, so it's, you can see it's a different mix depending on the reactor series that they're going through. Then you can split and mix again with A, B, and C, and so on, until you get that library of fully permuted compounds from the combinations of A, B, and C. Um, this is using a solid surface, so it's a heterogeneous system, but you can also use this type of mix and split method in a homogeneous system. And as we noted before, using that solid version of resin is helpful because you can then easily purify the different samples. And so that's kind of how um, that synthesis works. Moving on to parallel synthesis. This synthesis is similar to the previous technique because it is automated and it does often use solid phase chemistry and it does generate a library of similar compounds. The difference is that each compound is produced separately, so we do not get a mixture in parallel synthesis. And usually there's a smaller, more focused library uh, generated. And you, you may see the first type of synthesis used to get a broad screening of different compounds and then going to parallel synthesis to kind of narrow that larger mixture of that library down. Okay, then you need a high, through, high throughput screening and this is used for either of the libraries that are generated um, from the synthesis process. It's an automated process to test the biological activity of the library of compounds that were produced, or sometimes to identify that lead compound. It is designed to produce an easily measurable effect, meaning you're looking for a quick color change, a radioactive marker, something like that. You want something that is easy to scan and quickly identify the components that have a biological activity. You can use this high throughput screening at several spots, meaning when you're trying to identify the lead compound or at the end of that first phase zero. A okay, computer aided design with the analytical methods that have come about, uh, like things like X ray, crystal look, <sighs> X ray analysis, NMR, uh, infrared technology. All of these are used to determine a 3D structure of the biomolecular target with a great deal of accuracy. So instead of actually running trials with um, real materials, we can use computer models to accurately market, model the target. And then those models are then used to identify molecules that are an optimal fit for the active site. 
And this can be a much more rational, efficient uh, process, much more uh, cost effective. Okay. The part of the drug. Um, you can use the part of the drug molecule that permits specific binding with the bimolecular bi target, all right? And things like finding the distance between, say, these two rings and the distance between that amine group to really define what the um, drug has to look like. So you're pretty much using um, this structure to figure out that part of the drug molecule. All right? So the analysis of the actual um, molecule with the the bimolecular target can be used to, to really design that drug molecule. Okay. Moving into the next category, strategies for drug designs. Really, the idea here is, what we've just covered, is to build molecules that bind to the biomarkers in the body and to modify molecules to improve the stability in the body. And then the third will be the building the molecules that exhibit stereoisomerism. So we're going to look at that second one, modifying molecules to improve the solubility in the building, in the body. So let's define a term. Bioavailability. Bioavailability is really the percentage of a drug that makes it to the target site in the body. Okay? And if you think about our bodies being mostly water, hopefully it'll make sense that polar or ionic molecules usually have a higher bioavailability. So one strategy to use is to modify a molecule to add an ionic group into its structure. And this would make, obviously, the drug more ionic, and it should be more soluble in the body. So there's a greater chance that more of that drug will make it to the target site in the body. So let's look at aspirin. Okay, and the strategy here, aspirin, not very soluble um, in the body, but if we take this, this carboxyl group and react this H, right, that acidic hydrogen, with a base such as sodium hydroxide, we will make a sodium salt of aspirin. Okay, here is your ionic part right here, making it a salt. Remember, salt, common term for ionic compound. And that will um, make it more soluble and should deliver more of that d drug to the target area of the body. Okay. Okay, looking at this particular drug here, this is a precursor to Prozac. Looking at the structure of this molecule, you can see it's not very soluble, right? It's got an amide group here, a secondary amine, I'm sorry, an amine group. There's no C double bonded O. Secondary amine group. which makes this weakly basic. Okay, so if we react it with an acid, we will again make this um, ionic. Okay, this, I don't know if you can read it very well, it's an NH2 with a plus with a Cl minus. This ionic group should make this more soluble in the body. Um, so reacting this weak basic group with that strong acid should make it more of it reach the target in the body. Okay. So, moving on to this last part, and this is going to focus on building molecules that exhibit stereoisomerism, which, if you remember, is a um, characteristic of some of the drugs. It's through a process called asymmetric synthesis, okay, and the um, 
The objective here is to th synthesize a single enantiomer of a molecule instead of the mix of the enantiomers that usually um, come about. And it's called uh, enantiomeric synthesis. Um, And this really just lets us make that one enantiomer that is going to be the active one. Right? Through this asymmetric synthesis, we need a chiral auxiliary. This is a chiral molecule that's going to bind to a reactant in a synthesis reaction. And this is going to impart chiral character to that reactant. And it forces the reaction to proceed with a specific stereochemistry. And so you kind of uh, limit the reactant sites for the drug to react with, forcing it into a certain chiral shape. So let's look at an example of this. Okay. Normally, um, take two hydroxypropanoic acid. That's what we're going to be making here. Okay. We take pro propanoic acid. There is no chiral center in this structure. So we would react it um, and end up forming a mixture of both of the an enantiomers. Remember, a chiral center is that carbon that has four different functional groups attached to it. So here is one functional group, second different one, Okay, so there are four unique functional groups attached to this. If we add a chiral auxiliary, that would be this grouping right here. That is your chiral auxiliary. Um, this has a chiral um, has chiral character. And what it does is it forces the hydroxyl group to only add at this spot. You can see it only adds here. So something about the geometry of this chiral auxiliary, and that's why they're chosen, um, only enables the chiral, the hydroxyl, to add to that one carbon. Then you remove this group, and you only form the one enantiomer. This does add more steps to the process. However, it makes more of the active product, um, so it may be more cost effective in the long run. And that ends this screencast.